Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Half of Americans undergo some form of psychotherapy in their lifetimes. Psychotherapy works, or does it? Freudian analysis is passe, or is it? Psychopharmacology, drugs, or modern miracles, or are they? Talk about psychotherapy, its history, its successes and failures, its fads and fashions, and its finances and its future is Jonathan Engel, professor and associate dean at the School of Public Affairs at Baruch College and a colleague of mine. He's recently published a book, American Therapy, The Rise of Psychotherapy in the United States, which has been widely praised and has stimulated debate. He has authored three other books on the historical evolution of U.S. health and social welfare policy, including Doctors and Reformers, Discussions and Debate on Health Policy, 1929 to 1950, Poor People's Medicine, Medicaid, and U.S. Charity Care since 1965, and finally, The Epidemic. A History of AIDS. He is currently writing a history of the U.S. healthcare system since 1970. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Congratulations. Very nice review on the Times. Still crazy after all these years, many of us, <laughs> and elsewhere. But you certainly stirred up a lot of members of the psychoanalytical community. You seem to have touched a nerve, in fact, many of them. Uh, Sunday, January 11th, New York Times letters. Ooh, you really, they're really pretty defensive. Talk about the reactions to the book. Right. I, I, to be honest, the, the book is not really about psychoanalysis entirely. It's not really meant to be an attack on psychoanalysis. It's meant to be a measured, rather objective look at a timeline of psychotherapy in this country. Very, very few psychoanalysts or psych psychotherapists are psychoanalysts. 650,000 people in this country are practicing psychotherapy. It's hard to get an exact number. There's probably 200 or fewer people actually making a living doing psychoanalysis. And they, so, I think they all wrote, and they all wrote to the, the time. time. So, I mean, we're talking about a minuscule population, and yet that minuscule population continues to have, you know, an enormously important place in America's mindset. We all read about them in intellectual history courses. We study about them in English class. Psychology students still read about Freud. It, it, there's a huge disconnect between the historical importance of Freud and the, 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 where Freud is today in the pantheon of mental health care. Yeah, let's talk about Freud. I mean, you know, being a, a former psychology minor, how did Freud become this, this, this paragon this, that took the United States and really had tremendous influence on it? And he was only here once, didn't particularly like us. And as you describe it, we're a can-do nation, often skeptical of intellectualism and scholasticism. How did we embrace, as you put it, an ideology born of founded siècle uh, European <laughs> angst? Yeah, I mean, I'm from Brooklyn. Come on. You know, and, and the treatment of upper middle class Jews in Vienna. How, How did, did this across? happen? How did it translate? It was not Freud's intention. Freud, in fact, as you said, Freud didn't particularly like the United States. He was, it, it, it's, there's a very odd disconnect. Although Freud wrote extensively about sex and infantile sexuality, had all these very taboo ideas, sleeping with your mother and loving your mother and castration and edible complexes. We've all read about Freud in college. And yet, if you met Freud, he would have seemed to you the most upstanding, upper-middle-class, bourgeois, proper gentleman. He never went out of his house without a three-piece suit and a hat, perfectly coiffed, perfectly groomed beard. He, it wasn't just that he was fastidious. He believed in this. He believed in sort of bourgeois, middle-class values. And so just because he was willing to push bounds intellectually doesn't mean he was push, willing to push bounds socially. Mm -hmm. He was not a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. He didn't like America because he thought we were too crass. He found something oddly uh, barbaric and philistine about us. He thought we were anti-intellectual. We are anti-intellectual. I mean, compared to him and his kind of Vienna at the turn of the century, it was about art and architecture and music. He thought we were a bunch of barbarians. It was to his everlasting shame, I don't want to overstate it, 
that his theories had a broader and more amicable reception here than in any other country on earth. It was bizarre. It was not why? what he intended. But why? why what it? was it about American society then and even American society today that has welcomed and embraced all types of psychotherapy. We'll talk about the kooks and the crazies right, right. as well as the, you know, the, the legitimate, you know, therapeutic uh, modalities right. out there. It's a good question. Um, Americans have always been, and this goes back to de Tocqueville in 1820, and we've always been open to strangers in a way that no other society is, partially because we're very, very mobile. We're a nation of immigrants, but it's more than we're a nation of immigrants. We move once we get here. And Americans today are still the most mobile population on Earth. The average American relocates once every five years. No other people are. I'll tell you a funny story. My father was from Cleveland. And years ago, that explains much. years ago, he was on a trip to Japan, and he wound up having a professional conversation with a colleague. And the colleague, the Japanese colleague, said, where are your people from? He said, well, from Cleveland. He said, well, how long have they been there? He said, well, since about 1915. <laughs> he said, where are your people from Kyoto? How long have they been there? Uh, since the ninth century. <laughs> and there was nothing unusual about this. It's not unusual to be the first generation of your family living in a town or city mm -hmm. in this country. Right. And it's totally not unusual in many other countries to be the 20th generation of your family. So Americans are very dislocated. And as a result, we've always been very open to very, very frank-handed conversations with strangers. We're joiners. We join elks. We join mooses. We join masons. Back to Tocqueville. We join, exactly. We go to church. The, the Europeans think we're all Jesus freaks. We go to church. You because, look at the polling and there's you some got substance it. to you this. You got it. And so what it means is that we're always breaking down the kind of family and tribal bonds which the rest of the world counts on. And that means that we have to be very open to new experiences and to sort of a deep, almost kind of embarrassing candor in our conversation. So something which is very alien to most of the world, which is sitting down with a complete stranger and talking about your innermost feelings and thoughts, for Americans, this is actually relatively natural. We do it all the time. We go up to strangers on a bus and we start talking about our mother-in-law, right? <laughs> this never happens in Paris. The French, I mean, the French look at us and they think we're bizarre. <laughs> Now, what about, though, the sort of the, the irony of the rugged individualist can do constantly seeking this, this aid and assistance of psychotherapists? Right. So you're right. There's a tension in America. On one hand, we're very open to new experiences and to new people. So we're very informal people. On the other hand, you're right. We tend to be, there is this kind of, it's not just a myth. There's reality to it, this ethos of the rugged individualist. We're sort of what's called self-abnegation, self-denial. Um, and what we've seen, if I've seen a real change over the last century, if Freud came to this country in 1909, it's exactly 100 right. years ago, so it's a perfect time to be doing this interview. What's happened in a century, there has been a long-term, step-by-step, gradual accretion of acceptance uh, of, of an understanding of angst and mental illness. I, I think there was a time, I mean, I know there was a time not so long ago, when, first of all, there was an assumption there was relatively little mental illness. There was an assumption that most people could get by, and there were a few crazies out there. Cousin Howard, you put him in an insane asylum. Right. He didn't talk about right. it. Uh, and for the most part, we all had problems, but you don't talk about it. And more and more, and it's really happened very gradually, understanding that these kinds of problems are very common. Lots of people have trouble. Lots of people have some depression. Lots of, we don't, they didn't call it this 100 years ago. Right. Lots of people have some melancholia, some anxiety. Marriages fall apart. There's violence. There's abuse. People don't talk to their brother for 25 years. There's more and more of an understanding, generation by generation, that this is a common part of life, it's, that life is hard, and that you can get some help. But this has been a slow road. There was no one crack that did this. It's just taken a long time. You argue very early on in the book that, and, and the, the direct quote is, psychotherapy works. Two questions. Yeah. What is psychotherapy? Okay. What are we talking about? Okay. And what, are we, what do you mean when you say it works? Okay, so good question. Psychotherapy is talk therapy. Psychotherapy is sitting down with another human being, either one-on-one -on -one or in a group. It could be a group and talking in a very honest, rather formal way about your psyche, about your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts. That's three different things there, okay? Right. Emotion, well, emotions feel the same thing, but thoughts and emotions are two different things. One of the big developments, by the way, just like sidetrack in psychotherapy has been understanding that thoughts are as important as emotions. Freud was very focused on emotions, right. on what you're feeling, and some memories. 
psychotherapists today are very, very aware of thoughts, the way you think and, and thinking, thinking cognitive. Patterns. Okay. So psychotherapy, you're either talking about thoughts, you're talking about emotions, and it's talking. That's therapy, okay? And it's with another person. And it can't just be with a buddy. There has to be a formal quality to it. That doesn't mean that the therapist has to be formally trained, although you're better off if they are. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that there's a rather formal, rigid quality. We meet at a specific time each week or twice a week for a specific length of time. There, in my opinion, there has to be a financial transaction. It formalizes, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. It could mm -hmm. even be five dollars. Mm -hmm. But it formalizes the relationship. What it says is, I'm paying you money, and therefore you have an obligation to listen to me in a very focused way. All right. Okay. That's therapy. Okay. That's a very, a lot of things fall under that rubric. Right. But that's therapy, and it can be more than one person at the same time. Does it work? The best way to say does it work is ask someone who's been in therapy, do you feel any better? <laughs> you clearly something drove you to therapy. Something wasn't working. Your marriage wasn't working. You're depressed. You're anxious. You hate your life. You hate your job. For some reason, you decided to enter this formal relationship. Right. You found a therapist. You're paying that therapist some money, or your insurance company's paying that therapist some money. And then you ask him two months later, three months later, six months later, a year later, do you feel better? 65% of the people who enter psychotherapy answer yes. 65% of people. Now, oh, wait, wait, I, I gotta go, say, go ahead, okay. go. What if you ask someone who feels crappy if they don't do anything right. for a year? Right. And they say, now you feel better. And the answer is 33%. So, roughly a third of people get better on their own, two thirds of people get better in therapy. So, that's double. And that, leaves that's a double. Bit, that leaves a third of people who, even in therapy, don't get better. That's correct. That's correct. And that's the failure now, of therapy. Who, it's not who, 100%. Who are those people? What is there a profile of the client where psychotherapy has been shown not to work? That is a very good question. So there's no single, we could, we could make some broad generalizations, but it's very hard to get it. A, there's certain kinds of mental illnesses which are really not particularly uh, subjective to therapy. Schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, can psychotherapy help you learn to cope with your schizophrenia a define, little bit? Define schizophrenia. Oh, schizophrenia is an organic illness of the brain. Uh, it's to some degree genetic. It's what mo when most of us say the word crazy, uh, it, disconnected thoughts, disconnection from reality, paranoia, that's schizophrenia. Okay. All right. So, I mean, it, it, if, if you ask your sort of your, your lay person on the street, is this person crazy? Or that, that person, I think they're insane. What they mean is that person is schizophrenic. Okay. All right? So, they're really, they're, they're just their inability to experience reality in an appropriate way. Um, schizophrenia is not particularly susceptible to psychotherapy. It just doesn't, it can help a little bit, but it, it really seems to be an organic problem. Um, but beyond that, uh, most kinds of mental disorders are certain people don't seem to be do very well in therapy. It helps if you're better educated, I hate to say it. Mm -hmm. Helps if you have a better command of language. After all, the vehicle of therapy is language. People right. who talk better actually do better in therapy. Those who are better cognitively. They're, they're cognitively, that's okay. why they do better. So all those things tend to work. I would say one of the reasons thing, people don't do well in therapy is they don't do it long enough or they don't work hard enough. Therapy is work. You have to sit in there. It's not just a conversation with your friend over a beer. Uh, it's focused thinking about difficult things, often thinking about things that you don't really want to think about. Right. And there's a lot of people who can avoid it. You can sit in therapy for 10 weeks and really never touch on the difficult stuff. Right. And you're going to walk out and say, oh, I don't feel any better. Well, you kind of get out of it what you put into it. One of the things that you point out throughout this, this history and evolution of psychotherapy is the, the lack of agreed upon definitions of both the modalities of treatment and what they were treating and a lack of scientific rigor in measuring what these outcomes are. You talked about, do you feel better? Well, is that the appropriate, is that, is that the outcome and how right. do you measure it? Right, right. And you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, it, 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 unlike with heart surgery or with cancer, do you have recidivism five years later? Does the cancer come back? Or it's even very with the, the, yes the no. psychotropic drugs. I mean, you do, do feel drugs. better, right? Right. So psychotherapy, and, and by the way, you could ask if someone feel better. They could say, well, I feel a little bit better. I still feel like crap, but I feel like a little better than I did, <laughs> right. right? And whereas someone else says, oh my God, I'm a new person. I, I, my life was going nowhere. I couldn't hold a marriage together. I couldn't hold a job, and now everything's better. So there are, you know, there's variation how much better you feel. And you're right. It's very hard to get at a really objective baseline standard of what improvement is. Um, sometimes good therapists these days, and I would say really for 25 years now, when you walk into therapy, a good therapist will say after an initial meeting, what are you trying to accomplish here? Right. Yeah. So they'll sort of say, 
well, uh, I'm dating someone, I'd like to get married, but I can't seem to get past these blocks. All right, so, I mean, there it would be, if you get engaged, that's success. Okay. And if you didn't, in a certain sense, we failed. Or maybe it would be success if at least, if you don't get engaged, you understand why you didn't get engaged. Okay. Maybe it's the wrong person. Okay. So a good therapist, I think, will try to work with the patient, try to figure out how do you define success here. Um, I hate my work but I can't seem to leave it. All right, so success would be actually if you got up the gumption to quit and find a new job. Right. right? Um, but for a lot of people, and one of the most common reasons people go to theaters too, is anxiety disorders and depression. So someone who's really suffering anxiety disorders, and I don't mean someone who's, by the way, an anxiety disorder is just that. It's when the, anxious, it's when the anxiety is inappropriate or unconstructive. If, if I have a, a million dollar lawsuit hanging over me and I feel anxious, that's appropriate. That's not right. a disorder. In right. fact, the disorder would be if I didn't feel anxious. Right, right. exactly. An anxiety disorder is when you feel anxious when a reasonable person wouldn't feel anxious, when there's nothing really threatening and you still feel anxious. So a lot of people walk into therapy with anxiety disorders. They're waking up in the morning, they're feeling anxious, they can't come down, and yet they objectively know there's no reason to feel it. Or depression. Again, if your wife just died, your child just died, depression is appropriate. Right. If everything is basically fine and you're feeling depressed, then it's a disorder. So people walk in with those two disorders and complaints all the time, and to some degree it's actually fairly easy to measure success if the depression lifts. And okay. anyone who's ever been depressed and been treated successfully knows what that feels like. It's, it's not so vague. The depression is like a cloud that lifts, and you wake up one day and suddenly you don't feel depressed anymore, or you feel a lot less. And anxiety is the same thing. Things that haunted you, that threatened you, things that you find frightening, things that got your pulse mm -hmm. racing, and you wake up one day and it just doesn't seem to happen so much anymore. You get through the day without that kind of anxiety. It's really quite clear, actually. The book is really an intellectual history, and what was very interesting about the book is the evolution of the treatments and, and also the colorful characters and, and the intense debates that, 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 that surrounded the field. Talk about who what was some surprises? Who did you like? Who did you find intriguing? That's who good. stimulated you right. so in I'll, your research? So I'll give you a couple. That's very good. I thought so the, the two heroes of the book, frankly, I think are a man named Aaron Beck, who's still alive today. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Albert Ellis, who was really sort of his intellectual predecessor. They're really the founders of what we call cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. Beck is a name who's widely known among psychologists, not so well known among the public. He is really a giant. He's a revolutionary. He was the one who said, let's talk about thinking instead of feeling. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who said, if you have anxiety disorders, yes, the anxiety is a feeling, but the path to resolving anxiety is not to talk about feelings, it's to talk about thinking. There's something wrong with your thought process. Mm -hmm. The fact that a, a dog crosses your path and your heart starts racing, there's a thought process that's broken there. So it's something that someone else would not find a threat, mm -hmm. you're perceiving as a threat. Your thoughts are racing, they're out of control. Something's a loop in there. And Beck was really able to say, this is not about your mother. This is not about whether or not you got breastfed. This is something about your thinking patterns. And you can learn how to think better, more clearly, more constructively. Mm -hmm. That's Beck. And he really, it was a sharp break with what had come before. And uh, he's, he's actually a good writer. You can read a number of his books. Um, so Beck, I think, is really a remarkable man. I was going to say, if there's a villain in this book, if there's sort of a someone who just epitomizes the abuses and excesses of Freud, it would be Melanie Klein, who actually, although this book is about American therapy, uh, she was British, but she was sort of the worst, the most excessive, deterministic kind of orthodox Freudian, writing in the 30s, everything was about infantile sex, everything was your mother, everything was a breast, everything was feces, you know, a kid comes in and they want a Barbie doll, that's really fecal matter. I mean, this is in her distorted mind, everyone was suffering under well, bizarre, do, twisted perversions. You they could do profound resolve. harm. Yeah. Oh, she did. She did. Uh, ultimately, her daughter suicided. Yeah. And the Oof. story is, the story is she was so narcissistic that when her daughter suicided, and she was informed of this, the first question she asked is, was my daughter talking about me when she killed herself? All right, that is maybe apocryphal. But she was so narcissistic, Ooh. she couldn't drop her theoretical orientation. So she, I mean, she was not alone. There were other people. She happened to write a lot. But there was a whole school of people who were so immersed in orthodoxy. It was like, it was a, a, a zealotry. It was a religion. They yeah, couldn't and, drop it. And at the same time, you have, you know, the, <clears throat> these orthodoxies. For example, in the 70s, you have this explosion of, which I... I, in, in my unscientific terminology, we'd call wackos and yeah. kooks. I call them kooks, right? Yeah, I mean, you have <laughs> asked, you have gestalt therapy, primal screen. Yeah. Rebirthing. Rebirthing, you know, these repressed memories. What caused that? What was the effect? 
That, that was just the, social I, cultural. Yeah, it was the, that was the funnest part of the book, by the way. In fact, one of the reasons <laughs> I got into this book was I had a teacher in high school who was into est, and he inappropriately sort of proselytized to the kids. He was a math teacher. And I always sort of remember thinking, where did that come from? And then when I found out that was really part of a group of sort of weird therapies that came into being all about the same time, late 60s, really more in the 70s, and like classic me generation mm -hmm. narcissism. And I, I, I thought it'd be fun to explore this. And that was really the seeds of this book, why I got started. You know, where, how, did, how did we go from Freud to Est to cognitive therapy? Um, they all came about the same time. All those ones, uh, Zen, by the way, meditation came at the same time. Right. The fascination with yoga and mm -hmm. Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. What was going on? It, you know, I'm not the first person to say this. Christopher Lash writes about a culture of narcissism. narcissism right. You know, it's a famous book he wrote. And I actually think that's the right word. There was sort of, um, I think in those years, uh, in the 60s particularly, there was a breakdown of major structures. And the two biggest ones, we don't always think of the structures, the family, all of a sudden divorce rates were going sure. out of the roof. Now, people had always had unhappy marriages, but now for the first time people were getting out of their unhappy right. marriages. Right. It may be good. It may be bad. All of a sudden, you're left with a broken structure. The other thing is people stop going to church. Right. I mean, for most people, over the last thousand years, the major structure in life has been the church. Mm -hmm. People stop going to church. So the two most anchoring organizational structures in your life, your marriage and your church, suddenly you've decided that they really don't speak to you anymore. Now you're lost, and you're going to start looking for an anchor. You're going to start looking for some meaning. You're going to start becoming very inward-looking. And I think that flowering of kooky therapies was a response to a lot of very lost young people sort of looking for answers. What was interesting about it, I'll give you sort of two odd things about it. First of all, it was very transient. There's, most of it died. Right. No one goes to Est right. anymore. Right. Three people go to Est. Right. right. No one does primal scream anymore. No one, you know, all these things. They, it was a brief flowering. And then most people, wise people aren't that stupid. They figured out it didn't really work. <laughs> and also, by the way, there was a, uh, there was a guru quality, almost a charlatan quality to some of these leaders. Some of them were arrested. They had to flee the country. They made off with money. You know, L. Ron Hubbard, who founded Scientology. It's, and then the, he's the, very much I mean, in the news. The, the guy days. was a crook, yeah. you know, among other things, right? He made, by the way, not that he was and stupid. Not a bad but, science fiction, right? Yeah, but yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. that's right, not a bad science fiction. So, first of all, people wised up, and these things largely died. Although some of the Eastern philosophies have stayed. There's still a lot of people who do Absolutely. yoga. Uh, I think a lot of people still find certain lessons in Buddhism very sure. appealing, even if Absolutely. you're Christian or Jewish. Right? Uh, but the other thing is, and this is what was so interesting, all of these things worked for somebody. Right. However crazy it was, you're naked, you're rebirthing, you're pretending you're coming out of, you're in a fetal position at age 54 in a suit and tie, I don't know what, and someone will say, I felt better. <laughs> and so this is one of the odd things about psychotherapy is that every technique seems to work for somebody. Now, some techniques clearly work for more people right. than others. Right, right. But you can find somebody who benefited from anything. Let's talk about what works for most people. What, what, what is, it, I, I know there's no optimum therapy, but what is the, the combination of approaches sure. that lead to the greatest levels of success? Okay, so there are basically three schools of therapy being practiced today, and it's very, this is stasis, this has been out for 25 years, we're not moving a lot here. One is what we call psychodynamic therapy, that's essentially Freudianism, okay. but it's, it's much more accommodating, flexible Freudianism. Psychodynamic therapy is, in many ways, what most of your, your viewers are most familiar with. It's talking about some childhood issues, some unresolved feelings from what's left over, this notion that you've repressed memories, feelings, ideas, and you need to get it out. You need to get it out, examine it, resolve stuff that's been there since you were four years old. Mm -hmm. That's psychodynamic. One is what's called humanistic therapy. That was Carl Rogers, came out in the 1950s. And that's much more sort of empathy. You just need a, a that's sort of pastoral counseling. Right. You're upset, you just need a safe person to talk to. And maybe that's all, you just need somebody to listen to you, right? I don't even have to say anything. Sometimes you just talk to someone over a couple weeks, you feel better. And then the third is what I talked about before, cognitive therapy. Sometimes come on cognitive behavioral therapy. The, the humanistic therapy and the cognitive therapy, by the way, are, are indigenously American. They were both uh, uh, evolved here. Almost everyone doing professional therapy these days is using one of those three approaches, and more frequently they're using a combination. The vast majority of therapists today actually determine, they call themselves eclectics. And all that means is they'll use what works. Right. They, they're trained in some well, cognitive it's approaches. American pragmatism. Yeah, you got it. It's absolutely classic pragmatism. The, definitely most therapists have a preference. You know, they'll say, I prefer this kind of model, but if I have a patient who isn't responding or a client who isn't responding, I'll use another model. So there's a lot of eclecticism. Do I have a few minutes to talk about drugs? Okay. Yes. Well, that's where I wanted to go oh, okay. to. Okay, I don't have much time. We have a little you, you put Three minutes. Okay. We, we, <laughs> you point in the book to the, the, the extreme importance and effectiveness 
of drugs right. as a treatment modality and the, the different generations of drugs targeting different types of disorders. That's right. So we, we've had antidepressants actually since the 1950s, but for many years they were what I would call very dirty drugs. That is, the drugs hit a variety of neurotransmitters so that they were hitting the the depressive neurotransmitters, the ones you didn't have enough of, but they were also hitting other ones. Right. And you got all sorts of weird side effects. Since Prozac came out in 1988, we've had a very clean neurotransmitter because it, we've had a very clean drug. It only hits serotonin, and many of your viewers are aware of serotonin. It really seems to be highly implicated in emotional disorders and affect disorders. Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, these are all very clean drugs, and they have been miraculous for many, many people who had really untreatable depression for decades. They, they really thought either they were going to suicide or they were going to die depressed. They started taking Prozac, and I, I don't want to, I'm not being paid by the drug companies here, but I will tell you, they woke up three weeks later and they suddenly said, oh my God, this the cloud is The evidence, not only in, in, in your book, but stuff that I've read as a result of reading your book, that seems to suggest exactly that. It's, yeah. they're, they're almost like miracles. Right. Now, what is the relationship of drug therapy with uh, cognitive therapy, et cetera? Good, good question. In fact, one of the fears when the drugs came out, when they were so good, was that that would be the end of therapy. In fact, that has not turned out to be the case at all. Almost all of the outcome studies in the last 20 years, and there's been some very good studies, show that almost everyone does better with a combination of therapy and drugs. In other words, what we now know is that almost all mood disorders, there is an organic component. Something yep. really is wrong with yep. your brain. Yep. This isn't just your imagination. So it's chemical. So, so it's chemical. you got to correct. It's all right. We all have things wrong with our bodies. Right. You've got to take the medicine or have the surgery to fix the brain. But then once you fix the brain, you then have to sort of teach someone how to use that new brain. And that's the therapy, all right? It takes both. You have to get the body healthy, but then you have to go to rehab. Okay. And, and the psychotherapy is psychological rehab is what it is. You need both. And I would really, I, I really urge people to sort of say, get the medicine right, but then get the therapy right too. You got to get them both. Okay. In the last minute, if you were to write an epilogue to, you know, this very recent book, what's the next frontier? The next frontier. Um, it's interesting. We're hitting a little bit of a stasis in pharmacology. That is, it's not a, there's no major drugs. If there's one big holy grail out there, it's schizophrenia, what we talked about mm -hmm. before. Schizophrenia is still, we're a little bit better at it. We can control it better. It's still largely untreatable. We really can't cure it. There is some very interesting work going on now in the neurobiology labs, trying to get at some of the roots, some of the root pathological causes of schizophrenia. And I think that's the holy grail. We're making some progress. There's nothing on the horizon, but perhaps in my lifetime, your lifetime, <laughs> uh, we'll see something where someone who begins to get schizophrenic syndromes when they're 22, and we can put them on some medication, and they'll really be able to manage this disease. Right now, we really can't, but maybe so, someday we can. So we won't have to be crazy after we all these years. We won't have to be crazy. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.